church family, I want to invite you to take your Bible, turn to the 38th Psalm. We'll be in Psalm 38 this morning. Go ahead and find your way there. And once you do, of course, I want to also ask you to draw your attention for just a few moments with me to our worship folder that I trust you received on your way in. Uh, First things first, uh, please take our Connect card. If you're a member of this church, please on the back, let us know how we can be praying for you and your church family. If you're a guest, we also want to know how we can pray for you, but we would love to get acquainted with you. And on the front of this card, we would ask for you to consider putting your contact information so we can get acquainted. You can leave this card in your seat on your way out or in the offering baskets in the lobby as well. Thank you for... Uh, your help with these. Let me also mention several of these items in the bulletin announcements. I want to remind you, uh, we mentioned this last week, but a reminder that there is a special called business meeting. Next Sunday, November 12th, we will have a brief business meeting following each worship service for the purpose of ordination, uh, voting on ordination for our new deacon candidates. Our candidates are DJ Flynn, Troy Handelin, Mike O'Meara, and Nathan Ward. So if you have any questions or concerns about any or all of these candidates, what I would ask is that you would contact Mac Goodwin or myself prior to uh, the meeting. We would prefer that, and we can help answer any questions that you may have. Salt Ministry, let me make sure that you're aware of this Christmas trip coming up, November 29th to December 1st. You can read the information about that. I also want to make sure that you are aware, for those who are interested, there is an informational meeting for our Brazil mission trip in July. Uh, That meeting is next Sunday after the second service. So November 12th, after the second service in room 102, right over here. Uh, The trip will be July 18th through the 29th. You can read other information about that. But we want you to know there's a meeting coming up where you can learn more helpful information. Uh, I do want to mention our student ministry is having a special gathering on Wednesday, November 15th at 6.30, their Friendsgiving night. So students and uh, parents, uh, be aware you're welcome to attend this, bring a favorite soup or chili. And I feel the need to remind you that my wife makes the best chili in the world. She would not want me to tell tell you that. I've said it before and I'll say it again. She makes the best. It is so good that when my father tasted Amy's chili, my father asked my mom to stop making her chili and start making Amy's. And my mom made good chili, but that's how good it is. So I'm just going to throw that out there. Uh, We can always see if anybody wants to compete with that. So uh, parents and students, be ready for the Friendsgiving night. Let me also highlight uh, Operation Christmas Child. It is that time of the year. Uh, We love this opportunity to spread the gospel through the Operation Christmas Child shoe boxes. I do want to note uh, that there has been a time change for the packing party. It is for next Sunday, November 12th. It's from 4 o'clock to 5.30 in the point. And you can read more information about that. I also want to mention that we as a church are a, uh, we are an official drop-off location the week of November 13th to 20th. So we need help signing up for those who can man the collection desk from others in the community that will bring their boxes. And then you may also be interested in going on the processing center trip where we'll go on Monday, uh, December 11th, uh, departing at 6.30 a.m., going up to Charlotte, and you'll participate in what they do on site at the actual distribution center. So if you're interested in that, please sign up through our Realm app. Let me also mention this, uh, our We Care uh, ministry in the community, they are also giving families out for adoption where we can adopt a family and give them some sort of a Christmas offering as well. You can read a lot of information about that, uh, but you can sign up in the foyer today for this. Now, here's what we have. Uh, We have received 50 of the families. There are more than that in our community, but we've received 50 of them to be adopted out through our church. Now, listen, here's, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna challenge and encourage and invite you to do this with me. Let's gobble up those 50 real quickly. Let's gobble them up today. I believe a couple years ago, the first service took all of them. The second service kind of ran out. Let's just make that happen. 
Uh, we'll, my family will do one. I'm going to ask you to consider doing that. Uh, so please, in the foyer, sign up to take care of a We Care family to help them with their Christmas celebration. Uh, a couple more things. Women's ministry retreat. We want to make sure you're aware of this ahead of time. That's March 8th through 10th. Please read the information about that. And ladies, sign up uh, on our Realm app for that. Uh, also, let me mention two more things that are not in the announcements. Another women's ministry opportunity this Tuesday night, ladies at the well is gathering. Okay, this is the last at the well of the year. They've been walking through the same theme of the presence of God, God dwelling with us. And so it is this Tuesday night, that's the 7th, at 7 p.m. in the point. And so ladies, you were all invited to that. I would love for, uh, they would love to see you there. Uh, and then lastly, I want to invite... Some of you, maybe all of you, but I want to invite some of you back this evening. And I'm going to share more about this in a moment. But uh, there, this, this space will be an open house for prayer from 6 to 8. Alan Vance and I, maybe some other elders, will be in here. I want you to know you're invited to come and receive prayer. It's not a prayer service where we'll collectively be singing and praying just to come and go. Uh, very, very come and go. It might even be quick, depending on how many people come. But it is for a response to the sermon coming up, okay? So I want you right now to be thinking, all right, Lord, show me if in response to the sermon, if maybe I need to come back tonight and receive prayer uh, and maybe even some counsel. So with all of that being said, I want to ask you uh, to follow along as I read Psalm 38. It is a Psalm of David for the memorial offering. It says this, O Lord, rebuke me not in your anger, nor discipline me in your wrath. For your arrows have sunk into me, and your hand has come down on me. There is no soundness in my flesh because of your indignation. There is no health in my bones because of my sin. For my iniquities have gone over my head. Like a heavy burden, they are too heavy for me. My wounds stink and fester because of my foolishness. I am utterly bowed down and prostrate. All the day I go about mourning. For my sides are filled with burning and there is no soundness in my flesh. I am feeble and crushed. I groan because of the tumult of my heart. O oh Lord, all my longing is before you. My sighing is not hidden from you. My heart throbs, my strength fails me, and the light of my eyes, it also has gone from me. My friends and companions stand aloof from my plague, and my nearest kin stand far off. Those who seek my life lay their snares. Those who seek my hurt speak of ruin and meditate treachery all day long. But I am like a deaf man. I do not hear like a mute man who does not open his mouth. I have become like a man who does not hear and in whose mouth are no rebukes. But for you, O Lord, do I wait. It is you, O Lord, my God, who will answer. For I said, only let them not rejoice over me who boast against me when my foot slips. For I am ready to fall and my pain is ever before me. I confess my iniquity I am sorry for my sin, but my foes are vigorous, they are mighty, and many are those who hate me wrongfully. Those who render me evil for good accuse me because I follow after good. Do not forsake me, O Lord. O my God, be not far from me. Make haste to help me, O Lord, my salvation. Would you join your heart with mine in prayer? Holy Spirit, I ask that you open up our emotions to you this morning. God, as needed, I pray that you will open up our pain, open up our guilt, our conviction. For those who are wrestling with shame even, I pray that you'll help them to be honest before you with that so you can do a powerful healing in their life. God, I pray that you'll do the work of salvation, Lord, whether that's calling someone into salvation or progressing us along in our sanctification, Lord, do that work using your word, and I pray this in Jesus' name, amen. I have titled this morning's message, Lord, I need your help. 
And I almost never point out the titles of my sermons. I'll be honest, I don't give them much thought usually. I bet I average 30 seconds of thought to title the sermons each week. But I want to mention this morning's title by commending it to you as a powerful way for you to pray this morning. You may need to pray, Lord, I need your help. David needed God's help. We all need God's help. He always needed God's help. But not only did David need God's help, he came to the point where he knew he needed God's help. And I hope that is needed. That's what some of you experienced this morning. You need God's help, whether you know that or not. But I certainly hope you come to the point where you know you need God's help. And not only did David come to the point where he knew he needed God's help, but he asked God for it. I want you to ask God for help this morning. If I were to summarize this psalm, I would say it this way. David prayed for God's mercy and help because of his iniquities, his infirmities, and his enemies. And we need to do what we hear God doing, what we hear David doing, rather. We need to do what we hear David doing in this psalm. We need to pray for God's mercy and help because of our iniquities and our infirmities and even our enemies. I am preaching Psalm 38 to evangelize those of you who do not know the Lord and to encourage those of you who do know the Lord. So let's listen as David seeks mercy and help for his iniquities, his infirmities, and his enemies. I want you to follow along with me as I point you to various places in this psalm first. Listen as David confesses his iniquities in verses 3 through 5. He says, There is no soundness in my flesh because of your indignation. There is no health in my bones Because of my sin, he's confessing his iniquities. He says in verse 4, For my iniquities have gone over my head like a heavy burden they. That's my iniquities. They are too heavy for me. One scholar points out you could almost get the idea of him drowning in his sin. And he goes deep enough to where the very pressure, the water pressure, starts to push down on him. That's how deep in his iniquity he knows he is falling. He says in verse 5, my wounds stink and fester because of my foolishness. So he's mentioned his sin, his iniquities, his foolishness in verses 3 through 5. I want to point your attention to verse 18. He says, I confess my iniquity. I am sorry for my sin. And we need to hear David confessing his iniquities. And then let's also listen as David laments his infirmities, his his bodily ailments. He's in a rough patch. He's hurting deeply, physically. Look at verses 2 through 8. He says, your arrows have sunk into me. Your hand has come down on me. He says, there's no soundness in my flesh because of your indication. No soundness in his flesh. This is, a, this is a physical health crisis. He says, there's no health in my bones because of my sin. In verse 5, as we saw just a moment ago, he talks about his wounds. They stink, they fester. He says, I am utterly bowed down and prostrate. All day I go about mourning. Why? For my sides are filled with burning There is no soundness in my flesh. I am feeble and crushed. I groan because of the tumult of my heart. Now look at verse 10. He says, my heart throbs. All right, so you can imagine there's blood pressure going up. up. My heart throbs. My strength fails me. He's weak. He says, even the light of my eyes has gone from me. His, His light is dimming. He's going through such a challenge that his heart rate is going up, his strength is going down, his eyesight is fading. Look at verse 17. He says, I am ready to fall, and my pain is ever before me. 
So we've heard David confess his iniquities and lament his infirmities. Now let's hear as David endures his enemies. Look again at verse 11. This is how tough it is, y'all. My friends and companions stand aloof from my plague and my nearest kin stand far off. His suffering is such that those who should be surrounding him can hardly handle that thought. They, they distance themselves from him. Furthermore, he says in verse 12, those who seek my life lay their snares. Those who seek my hurt speak of ruin and meditate treachery all day long. But I am like a deaf man. I do not hear. Like a mute man who does not open his mouth, I have become like a man who does not hear and in whose mouth are no rebukes. But for you, O Lord, do I wait. It is you, O Lord, my God, who will answer. For I said, only let them, that's his enemies, only let them not rejoice over me who boast against me when my foot slips. Look at verse 19 and 20. My foes are vigorous, they are mighty, and many are those who hate me wrongfully. Those who render me evil for good. So he is going through so much difficulty. He feels the weight of God's indignation on him because of his sins. He's battling physical ailments, physical, extreme physical calamities. And then on top of that, his closest friends and family have distanced themselves from him and his enemies are pursuing him. And I want us to see that there is a connection. There's a relationship among David's iniquities, his infirmities, and his enemies. Here is the relationship. David's iniquities have caused his infirmities and his infirmities have encouraged his enemies to come after him. Right, that's how rough it is for him. David's iniquities have caused his infirmities. That is not always the case, but that is the case in Psalm 38. Let me point you to one example that proves this. Verse 3. You may remember when we read Hebrew poetry, as we come across the Psalms, we look for parallelism that helps explain one statement by another. Verse 3, this happens. There is no soundness in my flesh... Because of your indignation. That's the first statement that's about to have a parallel statement. There is no health in my bones because of my sin. So the parallelism shows us that the fact that there is no soundness in his flesh is echoed by the statement that there is no health in his bones. Then we see because of God's indignation, which is a result of his sin. So in Psalm 38... David's iniquities have caused his infirmities. And those infirmities have encouraged his enemies to take advantage of his weak state and pursue him. So David seeks God's mercy and help. And now this is where I want to just directly encourage you, exhort you, plead with you now you need to do what David's doing. You, you seek God's mercy and help for your iniquities, for your infirmities, and regarding your enemies. First, I want you to receive God's mercy and help the way that David does. I want you to beg for mercy like David begs for mercy in verse 1. Look again at verse 1. O oh Lord, rebuke me not in your anger, nor discipline me in your wrath. He is begging for mercy. He knows he deserves the anger. He knows he deserves the wrath and the discipline. He's begging for mercy. Don't rebuke me. Don't discipline me, even though I deserve it. Please don't. I want to encourage you to beg for God's mercy the way that David does. I also want to encourage you to sigh before the Lord with a longing soul, the way that we, saved, we see David do so in verse 9. O oh Lord, all my longing is before you. My sighing is not hidden from you. I want you to sigh before the Lord this morning if you need to. That may be the most wonderful response that you could give in church this morning is to just in your soul sigh before the Lord. Just an honest groaning before him. 
A sigh that acknowledges you need his mercy. You need his help. I also want you to wait for the Lord like we see David waiting for the Lord in verse 15. After his friends and his family have distanced themselves from him, after he's acknowledged his enemies are coming after him, look at what he says in verse 15, but for you, O Lord, do I wait. It is you, O Lord, my God, who will answer. I want you to wait for the Lord. No matter what's happening around you, I want you to wait for the Lord. I want that to be your soul's posture this morning. And finally, I want you to cry out for salvation with faith like David does in verses 21 and 22. Listen to him cry out for salvation. Listen to him express his faith. Do not forsake me, O Lord. O my God, be not far from me. Make haste to help me, O Lord, my salvation. So he's crying out to God. Don't forsake me. Don't be far away. Hurry up and help me. That's how he's crying out to him. But he does so in faith. He calls him my salvation. He says, Lord, you are my salvation. That is a declaration of faith. And let me remind you that this word in Hebrew for salvation, it's the heritage for the name Jesus. So I want you to cry out for salvation with faith the way that we hear David doing in Psalm 38. Receive God's mercy and help. I want you to confess your iniquities just like David did. Our world and our culture are drowning in iniquities. And God has provided mercy and salvation through the gospel and only through the gospel. Christ has secured mercy and salvation for all who will receive it through confession of their sins. So I want to talk to those of you who are our friends this morning. I'm referring to our friends, if you are not a follower of Christ, if you're not a Christian, and you find yourself in here this morning, I want you to know you are our friend. We are glad you're here. We want to speak truth to you while you're here. Friends, like David, you need to confess your sin. You need to agree that you are a sinner and that that sin deserves wrath and that sin causes you to fall short of God's glory. You need to confess your sin, which would, if you do not confess, would ultimately overtake and destroy you. I need you to hear that. I'm speaking to you as a friend. You need to confess your sinfulness before the Lord or else your sinfulness will, like deep waters, overtake and destroy you. I also want you to know you're invited to come back to hear Psalm 39 because it's going to continue with this idea of confession. Now let me speak to my brothers and sisters, my fellow Christians, fellow followers of Christ, brothers and sisters in the faith. I want to encourage you to do two things. Number one, I want you to rest in God's mercy and help. Rest in it. I want you to be confident that if you've placed your faith in Jesus Christ, you can rest confidently knowing that he has given you his mercy. He has given you his help. Rest. Take a deep breath and rest in that. And also, number two, I want you to keep receiving God's mercy and help. That may sound counterintuitive. How could I rest in something and yet continue to be receiving it? But that's how the gospel works. We need to keep receiving it. We can rest in it and know that he always has more for us. His mercy is new every morning. So I want your heart to be able to rest, but rest expectantly, knowing that however much mercy and help you need, God is going to provide it to you because you have placed your faith in him. Now, church family, I want to say something to all of us collectively I believe collectively we would do well to ask God for his mercy and his help. Perhaps we should seek to identify, at least to some degree, with the people that Isaiah preached to. I'm going to turn to the book of Isaiah. Feel free to go there with me if you'd like to. I'm going to go to Isaiah chapter 1. I want us to hear what was true about God's people in Isaiah. It is true about us in very real ways. I want us to remind ourselves of this. I want to hear, hear the hope of the gospel as well. In Isaiah chapter 1, beginning in verse 4, verses 4 through 6, this is what God says through his preacher. Ah, sinful nation. This is Isaiah 1, verse 4. Ah, sinful nation. A people 
laden with iniquity, offspring of evildoers, children who deal corruptly. Listen, on our own, apart from the grace of Christ, this describes us. They have forsaken the Lord. They have despised the Holy One of Israel. They are utterly estranged. Why will you still be struck down? Why will you continue to rebel? The whole head is sick. The whole heart faint. From the sole of the uh, foot even to the head, there is no soundness in it. But bruises and sores and raw wounds, they are not pressed out or bound up or softened with oil. That's Isaiah's way of preaching What David says in Psalm 38, there's no soundness in his flesh. There's no health in his bones because of sin. That's true of us collectively as people before God Almighty. But listen to verse 18, there's hope. Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall become like wool. How is that possible? It's possible through the gospel because God gives his mercy and help through his son, Jesus Christ. We would do well to echo Ezra's prayer. Just listen to this. This is from Ezra chapter 9, verse 6. He says, oh my God, I am ashamed and blush to lift my face to you, my God, for our iniquities have risen higher than our heads. Our guilt has mounted up to the heavens. Did you hear what he said? He said that he was ashamed and blushed to look up to God. Why? Because of their iniquities. So collectively, we need to come before the Lord and realize that that we, we are guilty. We are submerged in our own shame before Almighty God unless we experience his mercy and help. I want you to confess your iniquities this morning. I also want you, like David, to lament your infirmities. Okay, the sin of the world has resulted in the reality of all sorts of of infirmities. Everything from sniffles, allergies, like I deal with all the time, to the worst diagnosis you can imagine. Headaches and fever and diseases. The sin of the world resulted in this reality of all of these infirmities. Christ has demonstrated healing over them. That's what he came and did. He came and he demonstrated the power to heal All infirmities. So you read the Gospels, you see Christ performing healing miracles to demonstrate the power to heal. But he is promising healing for all infirmities into eternity. So he didn't come to the world just to heal everybody's ailments. No, he came and showed his miraculous power as signs of healing that he's promising into eternity. Which is why the version of the Bible, the new international version of the Bible, if you have that, Isaiah 53 verse 4 says that he took on our infirmities. We'll be going to Isaiah 53 towards the end of the message. Jesus came to show that he had the power to take on our infirmities. So friends, again, let me talk to you non-believing friends in here, non-Christians. I want you to know that your infirmities indicate your need for God's mercy and help. That's biblical truth. Every bodily infirmity indicates our need for God's mercy and help. I want you to listen well. We have to be careful with this doctrine. At the very least, every headache, every toothache, every stubbed toe is a reminder that we live in this world that has fallen into sin and we need God's mercy and help. At the very least, it's a reminder. Let me point you to the the caption of this psalm again. Look at the very top. Psalm 38 is... Identified as a psalm of David for the memorial offering. All right, that, that's one way of translating what is written there for the memorial offering. That could be referring to what we see described in Leviticus chapter 2 where you bring a grain offering before the Lord and a portion of that would be burned with oil and frankincense as a pleasant aroma, a memorial offering to the Lord. Perhaps as a reminder that we need God to provide for us like daily bread for our very life day in and day out. We constantly need to be reminded that we need God's mercy and help We need him to sustain us. That's one way of looking at this caption. Another way of translating it, your version, if you have a different version from what I preach, it may say something like a remembrance. It's a remembrance. It could be viewed as as David 
writing something that would help him remember his need for God's mercy and help. It could even be viewed as David saying, God, remember me. God, remember me. I need your mercy. I need your help. Friends, I want you to know that you need that. Let this be a reminder of your need. Let every headache be a reminder. Let every toothache be a reminder. Let even every backache, everything remind you that you need God's mercy and help. We want you to experience what Scripture des- describes. Listen to this. This is what the Apostle Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 9 and 10. We want you to grieve, but we want you to grieve into repenting. So I know I'm laying it on heavy this morning, Right? If you're a non-Christian, I'm telling you you're a sinner, that you deserve God's wrath and judgment. I'm telling you that every sickness you've ever experienced is proof that you're a sinner. Please know that's true of all of us. We're not singling you out. All of that is true. But let those be reminders and invitations to repent, to grieve our fallen condition. And this is what it says. You were grieved into repenting. So looking at Psalm 38, you can see, gosh, my, my body is weak. My body is struggling from time to time. And sometimes, you know, it's, it's a result of something that you've done that you shouldn't have. And let that cause you to grieve, but grieve into repenting, Paul says. He then says, he describes it as a repentance that leads to salvation without regret, he says. That's the full gospel. The full gospel is grieve over your sin, grieve into repentance, a turning away from your sin, a turning to Jesus Christ unto salvation, which leads to no regret. That's what we want for you, friends. Now, brothers and sisters in the faith, let me say this to you. I beg you to seek discernment regarding your infirmities. All right, whatever infirmities you have, seek discernment and then confess your sins in light of your infirmities as needed. I want to point out one thing that David says, then I want to clarify what we're talking about here. Look in verse 18. He says, I confess my iniquity. He says, I am sorry for my sin. I am sorry for my sin. Now, we have a way in our day and age to water down the phrase, I'm sorry. Sometimes we say, I'm sorry, just to kind of get out from under the consequences, right? I learned something this week. I studied that word for a few moments this week. I am sorry, that word that David uses, he says, I am anxious. It's the idea of being anxious because of a threat, so, so David is aware of a threat, and, and the threat is causing anxiety. What's the threat? The threat is his sin. I am sorry for my sin. David finally realizes that his sin is the threat, and that's causing an anxiety. In this case, it's a healthy helpful anxiety. We're not used to using that word that way, anxiety. It doesn't usually get used in a way that's helpful or healthy. But in this case, it is. When your sin is causing a dread or a worry or an anxiety because you realize the problem that sin poses on you, that's a good thing. So brothers and sisters in faith, I want you to catalog your infirmities and ask the Lord, seek discernment, Is any of this a result of my sin, God? Is any of this to be causing a a good kind of anxiety? Are you sorry for your sins? A church family, we need discernment for our infirmities. We need to confess as needed. Now, here's where we need to draw a distinction. You need to let the Lord show you clarity on this. Is your infirmity a John 9 or a John 11 infirmity? Which is not a result of your sin. John 9, the man born blind. John 11, Lazarus dying. Those were occasions where God put those sufferings into those men's life to draw out something for his glory. The man was born blind. It was not a result of his sin. It was not a result of his parents' sin. It was because God wanted to show His glory through healing the man, pointing forward to the fact that he was the light of the world. In John 11, Lazarus gets sick, 
dies. Jesus says it's not going to end in death. This is going to end in a powerful display of the glory of God. So your infirmity might fall under that category. You may realize, I just, I just have this. This is the reality of our world. It's something I struggle with. I mentioned my allergies, and I know that's, that's little and small. I can assure you sometimes it's very discouraging. I don't think it's a result of my sin. I don't think that my, my nose runs because of my specific sin that I'm trying to hide from God. It's just the reality. God can heal what he wants. He can sustain me through it. And many of our infirmities are like that. But maybe some of them are Psalm 38 infirmities, results of iniquities. And you need discernment. You need to let the Lord show you this. Let me also just listen to this. You may have a Psalm 38 infirmity. You may have a 1 Corinthians infirmity. Listen to what Paul says. We read from this passage when we celebrate communion together. Listen to what Paul says. He says, whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner. And maybe we can kind of generalize that by saying, whoever presumes upon the gospel, whoever presumes upon the worship of the Lord, Coming and approaching it in an unworthy manner. Listen to what he says. He will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. Now listen, he says, for anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body, eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why many of you are weak and ill and some have died. You don't just cherry pick that verse to preach. Paul is saying that when those have approached this, the Lord's table, the worshipful reminder of the sacrifice of Jesus' body and blood and the promise of his return, when we presume upon worship, we can eat and drink judgment on ourselves, and that is why many of you are weak and ill, and some have died. And I am not saying this lightly. I want you to plead for discernment. Maybe that's what's happening for some of us. Beg the Lord to show you. I want to invite you to Lamentations chapter 3. Matt said I had an hour. How am I doing? Okay. Lamentations 3, just, you ought to be happy for Matt. I said an hour and a half when I was down there, but he said an hour, so I'll stick with that. Lamentations 3, oh, I want you to follow along with this. I want to read 26 verses from Lamentations 3, just going to read through it. I want us to resonate with it. I want us to celebrate. We have to wait till the end to be able to celebrate. Lamentations chapter 3. I am the man who has seen affliction under the rod of his wrath. He has driven and brought me into darkness without any light. Surely against me he turns his hand again and again the whole day long. He has made my flesh and my skin waste away. He has broken my bones. He has besieged and enveloped me with bitterness and tribulation. He has made me dwell in darkness like the dead of long ago. He has walled me about so that I cannot escape. He has made my chains heavy. Though I call and cry for help, he shuts out my prayer. He has blocked my ways with blocks of stones. He has made my paths crooked. He is a bear lying awake for me, a lion in hiding. He turned aside my steps and tore me to pieces. He has made me desolate. He bent his bow and set me as a target for his arrow. He drove into my kidneys the arrows of his quiver. I have become the laughing stock of all peoples, the object of their taunts all day long. He has filled me with bitterness. He has sated me with wormwood. He has made my teeth grind on gravel and made me cower in ashes. My soul is bereft of peace. I have forgotten what happiness is, so I say my endurance has perished, so has my hope from the Lord. They're going through it in limitations. They would have done well to read Psalm 38 in that period of their history. Let's keep reading, verse 19. Remember my affliction and my wanderings, the wormwood and the gall. My soul continually remembers it and is bowed down within me but this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. 
the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in him. The Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the soul who seeks him. It is good that one should wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. I want you to lament your infirmities, knowing that you can hope in the steadfast love of the Lord that never ceases. Seek discernment. Ask the Lord, why? Why am I battling these infirmities? Is it in your sovereign goodness and I can just trust in you? Or is it because of my iniquities? Seek discernment. Now, here's where I want to remind you that you are invited to come back tonight. Again, from 6 to 8 p.m., we're going to make sure that this room is open. It's come and go. You may need help discerning. I would encourage you to come to us and come and maybe the Lord is prompting your spirit. Hey, go and confess to elders your iniquities. Go and seek discernment and guidance over your infirmities. Go and let them pray over you in regarding your enemies. If you feel need to, come and take advantage of that prayer ministry opportunity. All right, lastly, I want to encourage you to endure your enemies. Confess your iniquities, lament your infirmities, endure your enemies just like David. We live in a world that has been under the influence of our ultimate enemy, that is Satan. He has caused opposition and antagonism and hatred and violence throughout the course of history. Ever since Cain killed Abel, and all the way up through everything going on in this world's headlines today, Satan is the root cause, the ultimate enemy of all of that. Nevertheless, Christ is the Prince of Peace and Christ is our means of reconciliation. The enemy has been defeated. On the cross, Christ absorbed the assault of our enemy in our behalf. And on the cross, Christ absorbed the wrath of God for our sin. He was multitasking. Christ absorbed all of that for us. He absorbed the enemy's assault and he absorbed God the Father's righteous wrath in our behalf. I want you to look again at verses 13 and 14 in our psalm. We see David enduring, enduring his enemies, but I am like a deaf man. I do not hear like a mute man who does not open his mouth. I have become like a man who does not hear and in whose mouth are no rebukes. In these two verses, we can hear the silence of salvation. I want you to listen more to the silence of salvation. We're told in Isaiah 53, he was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, like a sheep that before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. In 1 Peter chapter 2, we are told when he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. I just want to say again what Peter said. By his wounds, by Christ's wounds, you have been healed. Friends, non-Christians, you need to understand that in your sin, you are an enemy against God. You desperately need his mercy and help. And furthermore, you need deliverance from the ultimate enemy, the devil. You need that. That is true about you, whether you have realized that or not. And brothers and sisters in the faith, we also, we need to realize that our allegiance to Christ will result in having some enemies. We know that. You claim Christ, you follow Christ, you will have some enemies in life. I want to encourage you, if that's the case right now, endure your enemies seeking mercy and help from God. I also want to encourage you to pray for your enemies that they would seek and receive mercy and help from God through Jesus Christ, which was true of you. You and I and our sinfulness were enemies of God and through Christ we were reconciled. Our enemies need that same reconciliation. Pray for it. Church family, this truth goes also for us collectively. We need to pray for our enemies that they would seek God's mercy and help through Jesus Christ. And all the while, we can praise Jesus for his finished work of reconciliation. 
I want to close by reading to you from Isaiah 53. Just listen to these verses, receive them. Feel free to even close your eyes and just prepare for the prayer. Isaiah 53, verses 3 through 12, a prophecy about the Son of God. Jesus fulfilled this prophecy. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away, and as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people? And they made his grave with the wicked, and with a rich man in his death, although he had done no violence, and there was no deceit in his mouth, yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring, he shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death. And was numbered with the transgressors, yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. Let's pray. Jesus, we praise you for fulfilling Isaiah 53. We praise you for resolving Psalm 38 for us. Heavenly Father, I ask that confession for sin takes place in response to your word as needed. God, I also ask that lamentation over infirmities takes place as needed. I also ask, Lord, that you would help us to endure our enemies, especially our ultimate enemy, knowing that you have secured the victory through your son Jesus who has taken on our guilt, our infirmities, our grief, who is interceding for us in this moment, which is why we can pray. And it's why we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Church, would you stand as we respond to the word this morning? When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well my soul it is well with my soul it is well it is well with my soul my sin oh the bliss of this glorious thought my sin not in part but the whole is nailed to the cross and i bear it no more 
praise the Lord, praise the Lord, O oh my soul, it is well with my soul, it is well, it is well with my soul, and Lord, haste the day when the faith shall be sighed, the clouds be rolled back as a scroll, the trump shall resound, and the Lord shall descend, even so it is well with my soul, it is well with my soul, it is well, it is well with my soul, it is well, it is well with my soul. Before I read your benediction, I just want to say that if God prompts you, I look forward to seeing you back in here this evening for prayer. Listen to these words, receive these words from Romans chapter 7, verse 24 through chapter 8, verse 1. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then I myself serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh I serve the law of sin. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And to that we say amen.